This episode is sponsored by Interactive Brokers. I don't want you to take the time to discover the future of trading with IBKR Desktop, Interactive Brokers' next-generation trading platform. Built from the ground up, IBKR Desktop combines their powerful features with a unique set of groundbreaking trading tools in a streamlined, intuitive interface. What else can you ask for, right? With access to over 150 markets, IBKR Desktop puts global stocks and options, futures, currencies, bonds, and funds at your fingertips all in one place. And what's more, IBKR Desktop includes innovative features like multi-sort, which lets you sort data using multiple factors simultaneously, helping you quickly identify trading opportunities, and the options lattice, which visually highlights key metrics for smarter decisions. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, IBKR Desktop redefines what traders can expect from a trading platform. So do yourself a favor, will you? Experience the future of trading today. Download IBKR Desktop at IBKR.com slash desktop. Interactive Brokers is a member of SIPC. The Disciplined Investor is all about you, your money, and the markets. Sit back and get ready for this edition of the Disciplined Investor Podcast. This episode of The Disciplined Investor is sponsored by Horowitz & Company. If you're looking for a portfolio manager, look no further. Horowitz & Company, from seed through harvest, cultivating financial success. The Fed is Powell throwing in the towel. AI, profit spreading, lots of money to be made. Apple dragged down by a new lawsuit. And our guest today is Paul Merriman. He's an author, investor, and financial educator. All this and much more on episode number 861 of the Disciplined Investor Podcast. doing? How's your money doing? How you doing? How's your money doing? Should be pretty good in what we're seeing right now in these markets, right? And if not, well, it's not too late. It's never too late. It's never too late just to make it happen. Listen, a lot of people are in that mindset, well, too late. Were you too late last month, the month before, the month before that? When is the right time when things bottom out, when you're like, oh my God, it's only going to get worse. I'm not putting my money in that deal. No way. Well, Got to make a decision, got to make a stand, got to stand up to the fact that we're not talking about one day, two day kind of returns here. We're not looking at the markets for a short term. Sometimes we are, of course, when we're hedging and we're doing things to accentuate our portfolio. But generally speaking, what we're looking to do is something in years and decades from now. That's what we're looking for. Hey, it's Andrew Horowitz. How are you? Here in the podcast studio in the offices of Horowitz and Company on a rainy weekend down here in what is usually sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. But it's kind of crappy out. Big storm coming and uh, made a lot of uh, things pretty wet. Uh, thank you, by the way, for all of your birthday wishes. That was last week. And I uh, appreciate all the kind words that you sent in. Makes my... My, my job and what I do and why I do it all the better, which is all about trying to get education. By the way, it's not just one-sided. I'm trying to get education for myself as well. And that's why I bring on some of the best guests in the industry, people that are tenured and understand all about various aspects of finance. We're looking to bring on some people that are discussing investments in farmland, looking at you know, things in, well, maybe it's gold or even in like last week, cryptocurrency. So it's not only focused on one area, but to help educate us. And I can't say that strongly enough because we need that information in order for us to do what? To be more confident in how we are going about planning for our future. When people say to me, well, I'm really scared about investing in A, B, or C. I say, well, what, what, what makes you worried? What, why are you scared? And a lot of times it's just because they have limited knowledge, limited experience, limited exposure to whatever that particular investment is. And, and really what's going on is what they're saying is that I need to know more to feel more, more comfortable. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's what 
goes through your head when you're looking at things that you don't understand, when somebody starts talking to you about an option strategy, or maybe there's a discussion about investing in the, in this biotech that does this, that, or the other thing, and you're like, I don't really know. Well, sometimes you need to understand that professional advice can help you along with that, but other times you need to feel confident and comfortable, and that only comes with the understanding and knowledge of what's going on. And that is why we talk about the things each and every week that we do here. So thank you for, for that. Uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you for telling your friends. And if you haven't told your friends, if you haven't told your family, send them a link. Say, hey, hey, check this out. This guy has been doing this for a long time and he can probably give you a hand in what you're doing. Down to business. Markets. <laughs> Powell. Yeah, I start out with Powell. Is he throwing in the towel? It seems like he starts out and says one thing and he comes on really strong and then just backs off entirely. Markets are all in a tizzy with the idea that Powell now seems to be more friendly to the idea that maybe, just maybe, rate cuts are going to happen. And what's really interesting about that, if you watch the press conference in particular, if you spent any time really studying the mannerisms, what he talked about, how he talked about it, and the sequence of what he said. What was really interesting, what I thought was kind of fascinating was some of the, I, I guess it would be the, uh, the changes throughout the length of the press conference. Now, Wednesday, what happened was we saw a rate decision by the FOMC, the, the, the Federal Open Market Committee, the Fed, and what they were going to do, and it was pretty well known and telegraphed and bet on that there was going to be no change in the overall rate. So that did happen. That's fine and all. But the real meat of what they talk about boils down to the discussions um, at, the, at the press conference, uh, you know, at 2.30. So 2 o'clock is the, is the announcement. They let it out there. They let it sit. They let it marinate, see how markets deal with it. Then they come back at, at, uh, at about 2.30. 2 and, and at 2.30... What they do is they 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 have a press conference and, and kind of go through it. Now, what was interesting was it was very clear from the the statement, the two o'clock statement, that you know the Fed is standing pat right now. We're we're nowhere where we need to be in terms of this inflation, and uh, the economy is um, you know still humming along pretty well. But a few things happened by the end of by the beginning of the press conference. When he came on, he said pretty much, I at least I saw that he was going to stick with this data dependency and really not going to cut rates until there's a clear path until in, you know inflation came down and blah, 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 and maybe there could be this or that. But generally speaking, it seemed to me that in the beginning of the press conference, the commentary that was prepared and what was being said initially off the bat was a Fed that was going to be pretty strong against fighting this inflation and not going to make the mistake of falling into the trap of cutting too early because then they could be in a pretty ugly situation. But by the end of the conference, the teleconference, um, the meeting, he, I don't know, it seemed like he wanted want to cut rates. He even hinted, oh my God, this was unbelievable. He even hinted that the latest information showed that possibly, he didn't use his word because he knows he shouldn't do this, that the latest inflation numbers were probably, I dare I say this, transitory. <laughs> I mean, really, that that was something that it looked like it was going on, talking about seasonality. That's the word was used, seasonality, not transitory. Seasonality in the numbers could be showing why inflation is a little bit higher right now. Unbelievable. You never hear seasonality is the reason why inflation is lower, only why it's higher. So we saw that the Fed got softer, markets got excited, small caps moved up significantly, rates came down, the dollar came down, the world at large was thrilled, gold hit an all-time high, Bitcoin uh, even came up from a, just a terrible move on the downside the last few days. But are we going back to that? Back to the idea of transitory or seasonality now? Markets liked it. They ate it up. There's always hope, I guess. Always a silver lining in any of this. And, and the good news is that the way the market reacted and what we saw on Wednesday through 
I'll say through Thursday, so it kind of was a carry forward through that part of the week, was that it was pretty board-based. Probably a lot of index buying. Yields did move back up, by the way, on Thursday, rolled down and rolled back up, still way above 4%. So there's not like all, you know, peaches and cream on this whole situation. What was also interesting was the dot plots and the outlook was pretty strong from Powell. So the idea now that we're looking at is that the GDP is going to be a little bit notched down, but still pretty good, strong economy, plenty of liquidity, reasonable rates, an accommodative Fed, the um, probably two to three cuts, supposedly, by the end of this year, maybe at the end of the year, and an employment situation that looks like it's going to be somewhere, you know, right at 4% or just under 4% unemployment rate. Wow. So we have a, a strength that has still a pretty accommodative Fed when you consider the ratio of where we are compared to where rates are. And that's why markets initially took that step up. Even in the face on Thursday, of some pretty ugly news with regard to Apple. And I tease this at the, um, at the top, and I just want to go through that really quickly because the D Department of Justice filed a, a, a lawsuit an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, which, which they said that the company blocked software and gaming companies outside from offering better options. Now, uh, of course, Apple said, you know what? We are going to vigorously defend themselves. Well, okay, we know that. That's fine. Well, it was interesting that Apple um, was, we were seeing that for days up until this point that there was some consideration that this was going to happen. But when it came out, uh, Apple shares, you know, came down pretty significantly. Um, still still holding up relatively well considering all things, but not playing at all like we see with other companies like, uh, you know, this name of Microsoft or, um, well, clearly not NVIDIA and all those guys, that whole realm. But any of the other major names, like, you know, the Oracles and um, even, even some of the counterparts in, in other countries. W what we're looking at the complaint by the Department of Justice is, is this. I'll give you some bullet points that uh, came off of the press conference that the Department of Justice gave. Apple's share of the performance um, smartphone market exceeds 70%. So this complaint alleges that Apple has anti-competitive conduct and hurt consumers and developers. I mean, they own 70%. They're probably going to have some of that. Um, the complaint also said that Apple makes, quote, other products worse Another bullet point, Apple's selectivity restricts access from third-party apps and the operating system. Uh, also, because they don't let every everybody at the store, of course. Uh, next point, Apple makes it more difficult for users to message non-iPhone users. We know that. It is, uh, you know, green versus blue if you have an Apple iPhone. Um, this is interesting. Apple drives users to purchase Apple Watch which is only compatible with the iPhone. That's interesting. Um, Apple forces use of wallet to share personal information. Well, of course you have to share personal information to a degree, I think, because it's, there's credit card information and the like. And especially if you get an Apple card, I don't know, that one's a, a little strange to me. You, you would think that's, uh, depends on how much personal, but there, that, that seems a little odd because there is the potential for Credit cards and all I, that one, that one thrown out. That one I'm not really going with. But the idea that they have an anti-competitive conduct and that um, they, they they have selectivity in restricting access from third-party apps and the operating system and all that uh, and this text messaging, I'll give them that. I don't know what this worth is worth in dollars. You know what's going to happen is, of course, the not only here but around the world, they're watching and they're going to see how much can be extracted. And I use that word seriously, extracted from Apple. Now, Apple has a lot of reason to defend this. They don't want uh, to lose though, any of this, right? They have really all of this market share and they have, you know, the potential for you know, this overriding majority of the market and that's they want to keep that. If they start giving up on that, that's going to be a real problem. So that's something to that we, that we need to look at and, and think about. Um, what else do we have? Uh, AI profits. We saw that uh, Micron... Comment came out with really good numbers last week. 
And uh, it shows that some of the AI craze is spreading to other areas because it's it's helping to sell technology. We'll say that, right? And whether it's cloud or whether it's uh, chips or whether it's machines or whether it's software, whether it's um, you know bringing in the opportunity for new things that we don't even know about right now to be developed and that to be sold, it's kind of interesting. At least if not AI, the power that's being created by the new chips that are being developed is really helping to uh, set up a, 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 a new level of technology experience and opportunity. And that's what we're seeing. And that's pretty cool right now. So something to watch there. All right. We're going to bring on a guest in a moment. I want to just, uh, st just stop for a moment. And I want to talk about um, uh, how you can make some money with interactive brokers. Because interactive brokers, the clients... So it's interesting because a lot of places don't do what they do. They automatically allow you to earn up to 4.83% on your uninvested, instantly available USD cash balances. In fact, I mention this because you have to wonder, what is your broker, you know, where you hold your money able to pay you? Interactive Brokers, Prudent and Conservative Risk Management uniquely positions IBKR to pay you far higher interest. That's just one of the many reasons clients use interactive brokers to trade stocks, options, futures, currencies, bonds, funds, and more. Of course, rates are subject to change. I want you to visit ibkr.com slash interest rates to learn more. And our guest today is Paul Merriman. He's an author, an investor. He's a financial educator. He's nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, asset allocation, he retired from uh, Merriman Wealth Management in 2012, which he founded in 1983. Uh, he then created the Merriman Financial Educational Foundation, which is, you know, education is, is, is something close to what I, uh, into my heart. And he ded dedicated to providing investors of all ages with free information and tools to make informed decisions in their own best interest and successfully implement their retirement savings program. So he's got some books out. We're talking uh, millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. And we're going to go on and on. He writes for the Wall Street Journal's Market Watch. And uh, he's got um, a multi-award winning weekly podcast, Sound Invest in Investing, named by Money Magazine as the best money podcast. Really? Really? Wait, where's uh, mine yeah, in there? Wait, wait, wait. I mean, to be fair, that was 2008. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I started 2007, by the way. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I started, mine is the longest run. You don't know if you know this, Paul. Mine's the longest running independent financial podcast out there. Really? Yeah, two, early 2007. You know, the, uh, I don't know when. We, we were doing a radio show in the Pacific Northwest. And at some point we decided it would be better just to go to the, go to the internet with the, with the podcast. Yeah, on the line and, back uh, then. I'll have to find out when we started that. Uh, please don't, please uh, don't, don't tell me if it's not, uh, if it's earlier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will not call compliance. <laughs> Let's talk about a variety of different things. And I want to talk about some things you and I talked about offline and some things that, uh, that, that um, you gave me some great stats on. I did some, some charts on um, and it, it, it's the idea of, see, Paul wrote me and said, Hey, let's talk about SCV. Now I'm thinking, eh, what stock symbol is that? I'm thinking to myself, SCV. Why does he like the stock so much? I don't understand. Then I started thinking about, I get what he means. Small cap value. First of all, Paul, tell me, tell me what your definition is of that. And, and it's changed over the years. I know not by you, but by others. And, and why that's such an interesting area for you. Well, there's, yes, there's a bit of a wild West aspect of small cap value because it, it can represent uh, a portfolio of mutual fund or ETF of companies of around anywhere from one and a half to six or seven billion dollars. And uh, and that's the small cap part of it. And the, the value part is going to, in many cases, be determined by the relationship of the price of that in the market versus the book value. Or it could be... Uh, uh, a low P.E. ratio. I mean, for example, the average uh, P.E. in a small cap value fund is around 12. And I think in the S&P 500, it's around 21. Mm -hmm. So they're going to sell at, at lower prices. But you got a range, a huge range. Some of those small cap value companies have 
are hold a lot of real dogs. When I say real dogs, they are companies that have some really serious uh, financial challenges. And uh, other people will focus just on small cap value that have higher quality uh, earnings and financial positions. So there is, if you looked at the range of the so-called small cap value index, there can be a two and a half percent difference between the top one and the bottom one in terms of just one year's return. That would not be true of an S&P 500 fund versus a, a, another large cap blend uh, fund in the index world. So uh, it's, it's, it's much, there are lots of ways to slice and dice and call it small cap value. And I think the key is to try to figure out what has the probability, we're all trying to figure that out, uh, to do the best in the future. And that's our focus, just like anybody else. So small cap, one of the recent statistics that I think, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but something about the Russell 2000, something like 40% of the Russell 2000 or zombie companies, which it means that, you know, they don't have enough earnings to actually make ends meet by the end of the day and have to do some either creative accounting or some, uh, you know, maybe, maybe sell some stock or some other debt financing. Yeah. I mean, see, that's the, that's the very low end of quality. And one of the reasons that that index and other reasons that index hasn't made as much as other managers, because, not every manager of a small cap value fund, even if they call it a passively managed, is dedicated to, to following an index exactly. And there's a what they call the reconstitution expense of, of selling some and buying others. And of course, in the small cap arena, the spread between the bid and ask is going to be wider and all that new money coming into a company is going to push the price around. So some of these mutual funds or ETFs are not efficiently being managed. Uh -huh. Others are much more efficiently managed. And it won't shock you to find out that DFA, uh, dimensional funds, uh, has uh, a more efficient way of doing it. And, and also Avantis, uh, an, an, a family of ETFs that came, the folks came out of DFA. So uh, there, there are some huge differences uh, between these. But yes, you spotted a, a, a really bad one in a way of the Russell 2000. Plus, think about those more thinly capitalized companies. When it is time to reconstitute that fund, it mm -hmm. can cost a lot of money to get in and get out. Yeah, just the swing. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because when I look at uh, the universe, somebody, we get a lot of questions on this. Like, why are you using mutual funds versus an, an ETF, right? And I said, listen, it's not about mutual fund versus ETF necessarily. But they're really, um, oftentimes, back in the day when ETFs were first created, they were passive, most of them, right? There was not a lot of active ETFs. So what you did was you were following the Russell 2000, whether you got the growth side, the value side, the blend side. And DFA, which is, is Paul's mentioning, is um, they're a factor-based uh, shop. And they're taking different factors. Like they're probably saying, we don't want the unprofitable <laughs> Russell 2000s. Give us, you know, as simple as it gets, right, Paul? Just That's give us right. the profitable small caps. End of sentence. Let's just stop there. That's right. And, I mean, and, that's, and that's a mutual fund. And that was a mutual fund for years. Right. Well, th that's true. But but here's, here's our challenge. Uh, there's a fellow who joined our organization, and we are all unpaid volunteers totally. Uh, and this guy has has put in hundreds of hours a year uh, helping us. He's a retired engineer, in fact, from NVIDIA. Uh, and uh, and he, he built what we call best-in-class ETFs. So, uh, th by the way, that's his best-in-class defined by the size, the expense, the turnover, the quality, the momentum. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that go into identifying the ETFs, but many, um, in fact, most 401k plans do not give you right. access. So you got to go to mutual funds. So we have a Vanguard account and a Fidelity, when I say account, recommendations uh, there as well as Fidelity and Schwab. Uh, and mostly thinking in terms of the 401k, but I'm with you 
you're right about the ETFs. That that is the right place to be for the long term because you know we're talking, we're teaching people to do something that we think they can do on their own, and that is to buy and hold. Not all of them can do that. Right, but, but also, but also the 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 ETF being passive. Uh, not only, not always can in these inefficient, and I think we both agree that the small cap universe is either inefficient or less efficient than the large cap universe. You yeah. know, the S and P five hundred, the, the Russell one thousand, or pick pick your poison, what you want to look at from from that point. The the mutual fund active manager was one of the only plays, and, and still to this day, to a degree, even though they're a bit more expensive. Um, and, and putting aside the tax implications, right? The, the yeah. tax inefficiency yeah. is the only way to really get a decent return in some of these areas. Like if we're digging all the way down a small cap value side note, what's your prediction on how long it's going to take if ever ETFs will land in, in a 401ks? Oh, well, they are available uh, on a uh, direct purchase through many for large company 401ks where they can self-direct, for example, through Fidelity, and if Fidelity gives you access uh, to the ETFs, you, you, you can get them. Now, I, I think it's another step to get it to be uh, one of the regular, uh, as far as I know, I don't know of anybody who's offering ETFs as the a part of the regular 401k offerings. But, you know, it's just a matter of time. You look at a company like M1, where uh, people can, uh, with a with a just push of a button, they can turn their their whole portfolio inside out to rebalance. Even if you've got a hundred different items in the portfolio, so that that's common. All of that stuff is common. I I can't believe it. I started in this business in the mid 1960s. Wow, and we didn't have index funds, yeah, and yeah. we had eight and a half percent loads, and we had had uh, uh, poor. Commissions that were outrageous. I mean, we literally could get a hundred and seventy-five dollar commission on the purchase of a hundred shares of IBM, mm -hmm. and if you purchased two hundred shares, it would be it would be twice that. So th those days are long gone. Everything has been turned upside down. By the way, I think for the in the best interest of the investor, I don't think it's sure. ever been yeah. as efficient as it is today. Yep. Yep. Now, if they can just get the decisions right, yeah. they got it made. You know, let's, since we're strolling down memory lane, if I may take a detour for a moment and talk about, you talked about the $175 commission, um, and you talked about, you know, the 8% commission on mutual funds on the front loads and all that. Do you remember the days, I think it was Fidelity, if I'm not mistaken, that they had a contractual mutual fund program, yeah. oh, which yeah. you could not get out of? right. And and over a half of all of the investments you made went to pay the commission on the part you contracted for. So if you contracted, I I, I think for ten thousand dollars, it means that half of the up up to that eight and a half percent was going to be paid as you put money in. So they were literally getting half of your money until you met the obligation of paying the commission. Now, their argument for that was, well, the good news is it's, those people are not likely to sell, yeah. and so they're going to be a buy and holder. But I find one of the amazing things is people still do not understand the cost of, an, of, of a commission over a lifetime. I mean, it's a half a percent lower return for the rest of your life. And people just don't get it yeah. that you got 95% of your money going to work, which means that 5% is not making 10. Yeah. Well, you lost five, five you've lost 5% permanently. Yeah. It, it, it's a haircut that doesn't grow back. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> you know, would you go and get I a haircut? that problem? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, interesting stuff there. Let's go back to um, the idea of small cap value for a second and the use of it in a portfolio. And, um, why is that an area that you uh, really focus in on? I mean, you gave me a lot of charts. You gave me the S&P 500 index portfolio, historic returns, and then you gave me um, the small cap value index returns, and then you gave me a mix, right? US 2, US 4. Talk me through that a little bit. Well, here's what I believe. I'm trying to get people to spread their money across more than one equity asset class. The S&P 500 
It's a, it's a great uh, asset class, large cap blend, but because it's basically really a growth different, uh, driven uh, asset class, even though there's some value, but the growth is going to make most of that money. Well, the, the impact of that is that there will be times and long periods of time when that asset class is going to be out of favor. However it is, you know, I don't know that I have to always be able to explain it. My, my job is to say there's too much history that that's what it does from time to time. Mm -hmm. that, I, that it's, I don't, I think it's going to happen again. But you look at the 70s and you, and, and you look at 2000 to 2009. Having all of your money in the S&P 500 put you through some very difficult periods if you were a retiree counting on the S&P 500 for a major part of your income. On the other hand, if we go back and look at the difference in returns, like in 70 to 79 or, or 2000 to, to 2009, I can't guarantee that they're not all going to go up and down together. But if you added some value, if you added some small, even if you added some international, not, not necessary, but if you did, it turned out that you did well. I don't mean you got rich, but there's a big difference between losing 1% and making seven mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're living off of the money. And so when you put together, and we have nine different strategies that we show a lot of detail in terms of risk and return, et cetera. But the one that I enjoy talking about, and it's exactly what I did, my wife and I did for our new granddaughter, you take small cap value and you've got access to an asset class that acts very different than large. And if you've got value along with small, now again, you have an asset class that is different than growth. And there's 96 years of, of, of history that has been dug, in essence, the, the, the academics have dug through the files to drag out yeah, all the numbers. Yeah, yeah. To build. They're all hypothetical. But I've always believed, Andrew, that everything in the past, real or hypothetical, is still hypothetical because you can't buy it. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, and so what I do know is that there's over 90 years of evidence that you put small cap value and the S&P 500 together. And you don't get the highest return because the highest return comes from small cap value. But it is more risky, and it puts people at risk of bailing out right when it's at the bottom. But when you have, let's say, a 50-50, mm -hmm. and that table you have shows it 40, 60, 37. I mean, you can pick the combination, and you can pick the risk you're taking. Right. But the return of the 50-50 is about 2% better than the, in fact, it's better than 2% better than the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And yet, the worst 12 months there was like 5% difference in the decline in the worst 12 months and 5% difference in the worst drawdown. In other words, the, the volatility and the risk does not change that, that much because there are many times, like 1997, the S&P 500 is down, is down seven and small cap value is up. Mm. And 2000 through 2002, a terrible period for the S&P 500, but a good period for small cap value. And then what people need to understand is the previous five years, 1995 to 99, small cap value was a, was a laggard while the S&P 500 was compounding at 28 and a half percent. I'm not saying that there aren't going to be periods that the small cap value underperforms the S&P 500. In fact, there are long periods, mm -hmm. five periods since 1927 that on average have, have just broken even at the end of 15 years. Mm -hmm. they, that you would be able to, to show that it didn't matter whether you invested in small cap value or the S&P 500. But you and I know, one, that nobody knows what's going to work next. We can't know what's going to work next. 
And more diversification, whether it's more companies or more equity asset classes, are all steps in the right direction. Now, I'm trying to help do-it-yourself investors use them by index funds. So I'm not trying to squeeze anything more than that out of the market. They should be they should be happy with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like the fact that you have the possibility of taking very little additional risk. And I teach my college students every half a percent more you can make will probably add a million to $2 million on your portfolio between what you take out and what you leave to others for every extra half of 1%. It's amazing. It's amazing. A compounding so, of interest. So two things I want to focus in on. Three things, actually. One, what you're really saying is everything cycles. So, you know, just because there's an outperformance of one area, sector, uh, you know, asset class now or the next three years, five years, the truth is everything does cycle. And you can see this. I'm just looking at this right here. You can just block off and highlight three years of outperformance for small caps, two years for S&P 500. And we could use this with anyone. That, that's, that's yeah. I think, the the uh, interesting interesting point there. The second thing is that, um, obviously, that compounding of interest as you can get a slightly better return um, is important. And lowering risk through diversification. I'm going to throw something at you. I'm going to give you something. See, what you, see if you want it. And you could use it and, uh, you know, you can reference me if you'd like. One of the ways I try to teach the idea of diversification, my listeners have heard this a hundred times, is the flower garden theory. So what I say is, you know, you can have a flower garden and I use Florida down here and you, you plant all impatience. They're going to look beautiful for three, four months of the year. Then oh, that tide turns it. and all of a sudden it's just dirt. You have nothing yep. but stems and, and weed like, and that's it. Now, if you plant the impatience and roses and heliconias and you put a little bit of perennials and annuals in there and some evergreens, the fact is that something's going to be in bloom at any given time of the year. Now, if a hurricane comes through, uh, you're going to have some, some things that are going to get uprooted. But the fact is much different than setting yourself up to only look really good for a little while than failure, than look for good for a while and failure. At least you'll have something in your garden that's popping at any given time. That's my flower garden theory. It. I already wrote it down now and put a circle around it so that uh, I, will, I, think it's, I think it's great. Uh, I really do, Andrew. And the key is, and this is where I think a lot of people go wrong in trying to do this. And again, we don't know what's going to be hot next. But the academics have blessed about 10 different equity asset classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that they go the opposite way. They're not they're, they're, they're non-correlated. But it, you find over time, international and U.S., you know, you don't expect to make any additional money from adding internationals. You might for some periods, and then you'll have make it less in other periods. But it does tend to reduce the volatility. On the other hand, the premiums over the very long term for large blend, large value, small blend, small value, REITs, we could always debate that. Uh, international, large blend, large values, small blend, small value, emerging markets. The premium over the long term for all of those. And now the question is, do you want to own them all? Or do you want to try to find as few as you can possibly get that will get you the same return? Yeah. And, and, you know, there is the challenge. And a lot of people, God, they got to, you may not know this, Andrew, but young people believe that cryptocurrency is less risky than the S&P 500. Well, yeah, well, they went for those three days every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, no. but, 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 you know, I've got to overcome uh, all of that. And, and by the way, the greatest thing I've done in my lifetime is I spent 10 years convincing a university in the state of Washington to offer a course about 40 hours of exposure to financial liter wow. literacy. There you go. For every student who goes through that. That's university. smart. That's smart. You know, you talk about the cryptocurrency, it's interesting. One of the one of the re, one of the things that a lot of the 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 younger and and unseasoned yet newly entried into the financial arena talk about with crypto is they don't trust the manipulation of the uh, traditional finance. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm like, what? No, what are you talking about? 
Yeah. I mean, I do not know a more uh, a more controlled market, manipulated market than cryptocurrency. Yeah. Well, in all fairness, I'll also say this to, to people. For all of you that are not investing, traditionally crypto, I don't care what it is. For all of you that are just not investing because it's rigged and it's all, you know, somehow manipulated. Well, if you go to a slot machine and I told you that slot machine was rigged to win, would you say, no, 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 I'm not playing it? Yeah, right. Go play. Yeah, I get you. I get you. You know, it's if if the markets are, or the financial markets and crypto and whatever it is, are rigged to win and you're like, no, I don't want to do that. That's just dumb. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you want to stay pure. You want to stay because you're nervous about it. Fine. Let's talk about, keep on talking about small cap value though. And sure. um, we know it's, it, it could ask, it could add risk in any given year. It could underperform in any given period. Um, and obviously I think uh, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but there's more than just diversifying between 50% S and P and 50% small cap. I mean, there's other sectors, right? There's other things to add. Well, yes, you could, but like in the case of our newest granddaughter, uh, we we gave her actually through her mother uh, runs the account. We gave her money that will eventually be used to fund a Roth IRA uh, and or a 401k. And so my reason for having that uh, that money invested half in the S and P 500 and half in small cap value, she does get large growth, large value, small value. And, and and just the exposure to small and the value is mm -hmm. small, but she will have 18 years that she'll be able to look back on. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is getting people to 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 see some piece of of history that they feel they can that they can count on, that they have a sense yeah. of confidence that the future could be, and 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 to have them, as John Bogle said, stay the course. Yeah. She's going to be able to see, oh, here, some years the S&P 500 was better. Some years it was worse. But look at what happened over the whole period. And maybe she'll have the confidence because at some point she's going to have the right to just dig, to reach in there and take that money out and cash it out. By the way, I think, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, you're talking about a 529 plan with the new rules. that can nope. be, No, because you can nope. roll it to a Roth now. Well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Well, as long as 15 years and a few other things, but yeah. There's a lot of stuff there. The purpose of this, um, we, and we put in 10,000 mm -hmm. with the idea that that uh, that should be enough when she, as soon as she starts working, I don't care what she's doing, she'll have a legal right, her mother will, to put that into a Roth IRA. But uh, I would like to get that, that 10,000 and whatever it grows to between birth and 18 or so, or when she starts working, I want to get that all invested tax-free just as soon as possible. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I didn't want to confuse it with, uh, the uh, 529. And yet I do understand why somebody would do that. That's a brand new rule. That's why, I mean, the brand new rule makes it almost a, 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 a no brainer to me where you can roll it after yeah. 15 years into a Roth and all that, which kind of like, Oh, wait a minute, let me get this straight. I don't have to really use it for school. I can roll it in, or I could use it for school. And I can, anyway, uh, that's for everybody listening. That's a new rule that's being implemented. We talked about, I, I think, a few years ago, we t a few weeks ago, touched upon this. But if you meet the criteria of a five twenty nine plan, which is a tax deferred educational program for your children and can be passed to siblings and things of that nature, if one child doesn't use it. But the point is, the old days, it was like, okay, here I am. I didn't go to college. What am I going to do with it? You know, and we're like, well, you can be creative and maybe take golf lessons. That's a higher education uh, or something of that nature. But today, the rules change that you can now roll it or move it to a Roth IRA under certain conditions, um, which is kind of cool. Anyway, let, let's talk about. Um, By the way, those conditions, I should mention, those conditions can change. You know, Social Security at one point was tax-free, just just for the record. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think this week they came out with the fact that it's going to run out anyway in 2033. So the hell with my retirement. There goes that. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about retirees. You know, we talk about putting it in for young people, new newly born. Um, yep. You know, 
long term, long, long, long term investors. Let's switch it up. Let's go to the opposite side, the, the entire opposite side of the spectrum. You got a retiree, 65, 70 years old, um, small cap value. Absolutely. Really? Uh, we have we have three really fine books that are free as PDFs. One of them is written by Chris Pedersen, the fellow that does the the best in class uh, T, uh, ETF recommendation. Mm -hmm. Right. The other thing that he did that has changed the financial future of thousands of people, he developed a strategy called Two Funds for Life. And those two funds are a target date fund and a small cap value. Now, the target date fund by itself can be a great investment for people who don't want anything to do with the process. Uh, on the other hand, if you can get somebody to put 90% in the target date fund and 10% or maybe 20% in the small cap value, it's a life changer over a long period of time. Now, if somebody is just now coming into re, into uh, retirement and they got a portfolio they're going to be investing for retirement, there we do show in, in, in Chris's book, Two Funds for Life, uh, we do show the impact of just having 10% in small cap value. And it actually improves the safe withdrawal rate by a, uh, uh, by, uh, I think about a half of 1%, Andrew. So that's, that's not and a And that goes a long way after for, for some time. You know, it, it, I, I recall something as you've been talking about this. Again, maybe maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Maybe you do and correct me. But I want to say that in Jim O'Shaughnessy's acclaimed book, What Works on Wall Street, I think small value is one of the key strategies that he pointed out in that book as a core, hey, this is this is it. Does that does that ring a bell? Well, it, it does. And Larry Swedro, his life, the the, the uh, portfolio he recommends not to everybody, but it's a combination of T bills and small cap value. Hmm, interesting, interesting. And uh, and of course, I want to be careful because we do not know the future will look like the past. Uh oh. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Disclaimers coming. And and I'm a teacher. I am not an investment advisor. I'm just trying to again help those do it yourselfers. And somehow we have to make a case that makes them feel they've got something they could invest in for a lifetime. But make it simple, because if you make it too complex. They get lost in the process, and then they go to something else that may not be good for them. So, so uh, yeah, between we're talking millions and two funds for life uh, at at our website, uh, Andrew. That those two, I think, will help a lot of people who want to be do it yourselfers. And by the way, we will have all the information on the show notes on the disciplineinvestor.com episode number eight sixty one. And one of the things also that um, uh, Paul has is a free book. I believe it's called the 12 things. Why don't you tell them about that? Well, that, yeah, the, that whole title is we're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. And all I can say is they're all easy things to do. And each one of those decisions is worth over an additional million dollars. Each one is worth more than a million additional money that you would if you had gone the other route. Right. I mean, there's always this fork in the road. What are you going to do? Well, okay, give me the facts about that fork in the road, and I can make a decision. And I can just tell you that at those 12 decision points, if you go the right way, it should make you an additional million dollars over a lifetime. Amazing. Let's finish up on this point, uh, which which I'm kind of curious about, which is how, how do you select the best performing small cap value index fund? Like there's a lot of choices out there, right? So we talked about funds versus ETFs. We talked about, you know, basic performance and we talked about the zombies in, in some of the small cap universe. How do you go about finding which is the the best? I mean, I looked at the Vanguard uh, small cap value versus the Vanguard small cap growth. Those are ETFs. Um, but is that the route? I mean, you look at the return no. since 2000 and what nope. I pull up here, five and they're even. 
No, nope. it's not about returns. So hey, let me it's cross this off. Crossing returns. this off. Crossing it. Big cross off. <laughs> what do you got? I say it's not about returns because what you're really trying to do is to find an ETF that has the characteristics that represent where you believe the premium will be for the long term. I can tell you, for example, VBR uh, has had a, an, a, an okay track record. But when you look at that compared to AVUV, the Avantis uh, small cap value fund, uh, they are, I think one is twice what the other has made uh, since 2019. Why? Because one has smaller companies, one has, um, they both have similar expenses, although AVUS is a little, a little more expensive. Uh, AVUS has higher quality companies. AVUS has the average, the average size companies. Then there's about $4 billion in difference of the average size company. And, uh, and they are not managed as efficiently uh, because the VBR is following uh, a, 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 an index. An index. An index. Yeah, it's a Vanguard and, for you. And Avonis doesn't have to do that. Right. So I'm assuming and, this can be a little bit more higher. Uh, expense ratio for Avanas. Yeah, it's I think twenty five basis points versus about eight basis points. Right. So hopefully they could squeeze a little bit more profitability out of that well, payment. I, a lot, yeah. it turns out. Right. And by the way, if you if you do look at the long term returns of these different indexes, like all the different small cap indexes, whether it's the the uh, uh, Morning Star. Russell, there are six of them that that are regularly being tracked. That difference between the way the kind of approach that they use uh, is is one of those two and a half percent advantages. Mm. I'm looking for a half a percent. Yeah, I really I'm just looking for a little little squeeze. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Paul Merriman, I hope it's been a pleasure. I hope that we could it's do this. Been- Last time you were on was 2015. Yeah, you know, I just want to warn you, at age 80, yes. I can't wait that long. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to put a big star here. Uh, uh, ASAP return. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. I promise I'll have a new idea. Yeah, there you go. Paul Merriman, tell them how to get to your websites, paulmerriman.com, right? That's it, paulmerriman.com, M-E-R-R-I-M-A-N. So it's two R's, one M, one N. There you go. All right. Listen, thanks so much. Thanks, and if you Andrew. want me for your radio show, your podcast, I'm always available for you too. No, we don't do interviews. Well, I'm not an interview. I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an esteemed educator. Okay. Well, I'll remember that. Yeah, okay? there you go. <laughs> as soon as I start doing that. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you. Bye-bye. You. Paul Merriman, 2015, last time on. Got to get him on again soon because his information I thought was invaluable. And hopefully that helped you learn a lot more about a small sector of the equity universe and where you can make uh, some diversification happen. The things that we talk about on a regular basis. So that was, um, I think, a really cool discussion. I got some so many charts and, and, and graphs and, and, and tables in front of me that he sent me and looking at all the different analysis on how just this one little change, as he mentioned, can potentially be such a big game changer when it comes to your long-term proposition of earnings and and returns. Really, really cool. Go to the uh, disciplineinvestor.com, episode 861. That free book link is there, and you can check that out and grab it for your own benefit. So thanks for joining me this week and every week. Next week, who do we got? Tom Nelson. Tom Nelson is next week, and we're going to be talking about uh, where Tom is, is a specialist in some of the areas that are, I guess, considered green and, and renewable and suitable and uh, interesting fellow. We'll have him on next week. So thanks for joining me this week and every week. Tell your friends. I'll see you again real soon. Nothing discussed in this podcast should be considered a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Past performance is no indication of future results. In addition, the information presented is not intended to be used as a sole basis of any investment decisions, nor should be construed as advice designed to meet the individual needs of any particular investor. Nothing herein constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice, or individually tailored investment advice. Remember, investing involves substantial risk. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results, and a loss of original capital may occur. 
No one receiving or accessing this information should make any investment decision without first consulting his or her own personal financial advisor and conducting his or her own research and due diligence, including carefully reviewing any applicable prospectuses, press releases, reports, and other public filings of the issuer of any securities being considered. Please consider this for educational purposes only. As always, use your best judgment when investing. Horowitz & Company, Inc. is registered as an investment advisor with the state of Florida and conducts business in other states where it is properly registered or is excluded from registration requirements. Registration does not imply any level of skill or training. Advertisements are not related to the host or affiliates and are not considered recommendations by the host of the show or any 